Hello, everyone. Good evening, uh, dear participants of the Morocco and the conference. Uh, good morning in California time. Uh, I hope we'll come back. I hope you have an engaging, important session and uh, made uh, valuable connections and good connections. So, continuing with our keynotes, uh, it's my great, a great pleasure to introduce our next keynote speaker, Dr. Sami Benjo. So Dr. Benjo, who currently leads machine learning research at Apple as director of senior director of uh, machine learning research, uh, is a renowned figure in, uh, with significant contributions in AI in general. Uh, before Apple, he was a distinguished scientist at Google Research since uh, 2007, where he was leading uh, a part of the uh, uh, the part of um, uh, Google Brain team and uh, at uh, EDAP in the early uh, 2000, uh, 2000, where he co wrote um, uh, the well known Open Torch machine learning library. His vast exper expertise in, uh, and research interests span many areas of machine learning, such as deep architectures, uh, representation learning, vision. Uh, natural language processing, and more uh, more recently, Resonant. As a well-respected member of the AI community, as an actor of um, an action editor of the Journal of Machine Learning, and sits on the board of uh, the NeurIPS Foundation. He was also, uh, was also the, uh, the editorial board on the editorial board of the Machine Learning Journal, and uh, he has also chaired numerous uh, top conferences such as NeurIPS, iClear, ICML, uh, ECML, and, uh, and many more. So please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Sami Benjou to share his valuable uh, perspective and insights uh, with us, Dr. Benjou. Dr. Sami, if I may, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Hisham. Uh, let me try to, oh wait, should I click to go to backstage or no? No. Uh, no, you can share the screen. Yes, share. Um, let me try this. All right, is this working? Yeah, perfect. All right, thank you, Hisham. Thank you, everyone from the organizing committee. Uh, I'm I'm very happy to have been invited by you to to give this presentation. Ça me fait vraiment plaisir de 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 pouvoir être là aujourd'hui, ce soir pour vous, ce matin pour moi. And uh, today I'll. Uh, I'll tell you a, a, a piece of work I've, I've been interested in in the past few years. In particular, I've been looking at uh, problems that I call the uh, reasoning, which are, are hard for various reasons. Today, I'll share some uh, insights from why reasoning is hard, even with the most difficult and the biggest uh, model that we can think of. So the title of the talk is Generalization on the Unseen. It's a joint work with uh, a few people at the EPFL in Switzerland, Emmanuel, Ario, and Kevin. And Emmanuel is also at Apple with us. Um, so let me start. This is going to be the outline of the talk. I'll briefly introduce the, 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 the setting. I'll talk about this uh, go-to, which is the generalization on the unseen, uh, and why it's an interesting setting. Uh, I'll talk about uh, some technical uh, uh, topic mean degree bias that will help us understand the limits of generalization. I'll give two examples of uh, where this is useful, length generalization and curriculum learning. So let me start. Uh, and I'll start with an example uh, that is going to be uh, very simple and of course will not be the, the real examples I'm interested in, but it's it helps uh, situating the, the problems I, I, I want to tackle. So suppose you have a very simple problem. You have three people, three voters. They vote by casting a vote of a binary number minus one or one. These voters, x1, x2, x3, each of them can vote minus one or one. And so this is the list of uh, all options that can happen in the world. Uh, you can see all the possible combinations of the minus ones and ones. Now, uh, we live in a world where we don't have access to all uh, the possible combinations. And suppose that in the training set I'm given, I never see X1 and X2, so two of the voters, they never vote minus one together. So they see all other combinations. So uh, these two ones that are in yellow, 
they are never seen during training. We call that the holdout set or the unseen set, which means that if I wanted to discover what's the function, what what is the what is, what is the function that is behind what x1, x2, and x3 are, are, are doing, I will have to do it with only the remaining part of the data, which I call the training set. Uh, now, the, the actual function uh, is the majority function, which uh, uh, I'll go back to what it is. But the, given the setting, given the fact that we're not seeing uh, some examples, in particular when x1 and x2 are not equal to minus one together, there's actually many functions that, that fit the training set. And all the functions that fit the training set, they are, uh, they are in this family where it's their real function, the majority, plus some other term, which here you can see in the screen, it's delta x times one minus x1 and one minus x2. Why is this form? Because we know that x1 and x2 will never be one minus one together. So one of the two will be one. And if you look at the term, that means that the, the second part of the function will always be zero. And so no matter what is delta x, you will see it as if it was majority of x1, x2, x3. And that's a problem because there will be many functions that fit the training set. Only one of them is the actual majority function. So uh, that's, a, that's a problem because we don't know what is the function delta x that will be actually learned by a neural network or any machine learning model you have, because many of them could be found. Uh, so that's what I said. This part will be zero on, uh, on the training set. So you, so that part can be anything. So let's uh, let's go back uh, to to the result in a, in like in one sentence first. What we found in this uh, work is that despite the fact that there are many functions that could be trained, that could be learned. Um, the model, if you train it using stochastic gradient descent, uh, will usually uh, tend to find a solution that has some characteristic. And the characteristic, we call it the, the mean degree function. I'll go back to all of that. But what I want to say is for now is that what we found is that it, despite the fact there's many options, one of them will be favored. And that we prove prove it for a very simple function, but we also show that it works for very complex functions like transformers, which are used for LLMs and, uh, and all uh, sequence processing or even vision now. So a very well-known model. Uh, so what is these uh, mean degree functions? In one, in an easy way now, so the majority function is what you see in the middle, x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus the minus the product of the three. That's a function of degree three because there is a term that has at least three of these x's. Uh, so that's the degree of the function. Uh, but we remember we said that we are going to learn functions that have this term delta x multiplied by one minus x, one minus one minus x two. And so what we will find is that actually the model will learn not the right one, but the function where delta x is equal to x three over two. Why? Because that actually ends up being a function of degree two. And that's exactly what we said. We are going to show that the function, if there are many functions that can that fit the training set, the one that will be chosen is the one that has a smaller degree, which is uh, which is a problem in a way, <laughs> because it's not often what you want. So why is this uh, setting important? As I said at the beginning, I'm interested in the in the the class of problems that I call uh, reasoning, and that involves a uh, a lot of things that we are interested in. Uh, in particular, reasoning is a uh, is uh, things where you manipulate uh, symbols and you have a combinatorial uh, number of these uh, ways to combine these symbols. So when you have a lot of these symbols, uh, the the number of combinations for them is uh, is exponential in a way, and uh, and there will never be a training set large enough to, to have all the possible combinations of these symbols. So what does it mean? We are going, if we want to solve these problems uh, um, of reasoning, we are going to end up in this setting where we are given a training set that does not contain all the combinations uh, of the values of the, uh, uh, of the variables uh, uh, of interest. That's uh, going to be interesting in many problems, whether it's arithmetic, whether it's algebra, 
uh, whether it's uh, some kind of uh, vision data set over uh, objects that can uh, vary with each other, uh, whether it's about the physical world, uh, there's many such settings, many such data sets that exist already. And uh, in general, we talk about these problems as a naturally uh, out of distribution, because we are going to have to reason on sets of examples that are very, that are potentially different from the ones we've seen during training. So with that, I'm going to try to explain the setting where we can actually reason about this this class of problem, which includes a lot of interesting problems. Uh, so in order to simplify this uh, the setting, we're going to go to an extreme case, which is often the case when you want to be able to, to prove something. We're going to consider a problem where you have access to only part of the training data, of, which is uh, uh, what we are going to uh, call. Uh, so the, if all possible combinations of examples would be omega, we are going to be given all examples that are in part of it, which here is omega minus u. But then there's this u space, the unseen, that we will see none of it. So we can see the all possible combinations in part of the input space and none in the other. Uh, and that's the and the question is what should we expect on the part that we have never seen, and that's why we call it the generalization on the unseen. Uh, what we want is to try to see if there are characteristics of the problem that will not depend on the training on the on the model that we use, and that you can, despite that, say, oh, we expect the solution to be like this. Of course, the question is. Uh, <laughs> Is there any hope to find what kind of uh, function there will be learned? And if it doesn't correspond to what we want, is there any hope to change the model or the algorithm such that it does correspond to what we want? We think it's uh, it's possible if you put the right um, uh, invariances or equivariances in, in the model that you have that corresponds to the setting, the real life problem that you have. Uh, so let me... Uh, let me tell you uh, this mean degree bias, which is the basically the result that we have. Uh, so I have to explain uh, what it is. So in in our in our setting, we are only going to to focus on these uh, combinatorial uh, examples of of uh, discrete values, uh, and we're going to focus on Boolean functions, which are uh, like you can see them everywhere, whether it's in uh, trees, in logical circuits. That's easier for us to, to work on. It turns out that every Boolean function can actually be written by uh, a, a sum of monomials. So for instance, the majority of three values is, as we said before, the sum of the three minus the product of the three divided by two. So that's one example of the binary of a Boolean function. And so we can basically decompose that function into a sum of terms, these monomials, and a monomial is just the product of the actual product of the variables multiplied by the the coefficient. That's that's all that you see here. So don't, it's not uh, not a lot. So that's we just want to decompose it as a sum of of uh, weighted monomials. Uh, now remember we have this holdout. So that's the set of examples that we know we will never see during training. And here it's this u, and that set is, uh, for instance, uh, in this example, we see we decide that uh, we we know that we'll never see the first variable being equal to one, and because we know that, we also know that that gives rise to uh, to a, a, a invariance class. There will be many functions that are compatible with the actual target function that you have. So if the target function was f of x, then all the functions of the form f of x plus arbitrary delta x times one minus x one will be exactly the same on the training set. There's no way for you to distinguish them because anyway, that second part is zero on the training set. Uh, so that's that's the reason we have to reason about that. Now, the degree of a function is just like the maximum degree of all the monomials. So if your function is a sum of terms, look at the, the maximum degree of all these terms. For instance, here, uh, f of x uh, has uh, two terms of uh, of degree two. So the function is of degree two, uh, no matter how you look at it. Now, the degree profile is a bit more complex. 
it's uh, you can look at all the terms and just look at the 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 square of the of the coefficient and that gives you like a, a vector and that's the degree profile now the mean degree profile again and that's where we are finally is a uh, is a uh, just like an extension of the degree that says uh, what is the the degree of each of the terms uh, and what we are going to find is that the, the if there is many solutions that fit the training set, it will choose the one that has the smallest degree profile. So that's the, the we have a theorem, which for some very simple class of function, so uh, not for transformer, for instance, but say for random feature models or for linear, uh, some kind of linear model, then we can show that indeed, when there is a choice, the model will converge to the one that has the, the smallest uh, degree profile. Uh, what is interesting is that we prove that for these small functions, but then experimentally, we actually show that it works for other functions, for instance, for transformers. And that's very important because transformers are the, the class of functions that uh, everyone is using nowadays. So uh, while we cannot prove that it's going to work always for transformers, we, ex we observe that it does. Let me let me show you an example of what that means. So uh, suppose here that uh, you have a function, you're looking for a function that has 15 input variables, x0 to x14. And the actual function that uh, that you should be, you should want to find is just the product of the first two, x0, <clears throat> x0 times x1. <clears throat> so all the other ones uh, are irrelevant to the problem, but of course you don't know. <laughs> And moreover, you never see examples where the two of them, x0 and x1, are minus one together. <clears throat> so that's the setting. That's a very generic setting, which means that on the training set, <clears throat> one minus x0 times one minus x1 will always be zero. And uh, it means that there's an equivalence between the product of the two and the sum of the two minus one. On the training set, there's no way you can see the difference. <clears throat> so what we... What we see on the graph, let's look at the graph on the left, which is called F2 dash RF or random feature. It's a, <clears throat> if you look at all the possible terms of the, the function that you can find, so the term that will be on X0 or the term X1 or the term product of X0 and X1 or the term one, <laughs> you can see the evolution of the, the coefficient of that term. What is the value that the model will find? <clears throat> and what we can see, is that both x0 and x1, uh, tr while training, which is uh, what we see on the x-axis, they, they go towards about 1, while the term of the product, x0, x1, stays near 0. And there's also a term uh, in 1, so the, co the constant goes towards minus 1. So what we see is that the model actually converges to what we said, which is x0 plus x1 minus 1, and not x0, x1, as we wanted. So it actually converges exactly where we said it would. On the right, you see the same experiment, but with a transformer, which for which we haven't proved, proven anything. But what you can see is that despite that, it does do exactly the same thing, more or less, with some, some leakage, leakage, but it, it's really doing the same thing. So there are many other examples about that, and I will... Uh, not look at them because I'd rather we focus on two examples that I think are interesting. One is the first one is length generalization. Okay, so what is length generalization? Uh, it's an interesting problem that people have been uh, trying to solve in the past uh, two years, uh, and in particular since uh, LLMs, large language models, have become uh, all the rage. Uh, the it's taking a very simple problem. For instance, in that case, we are going to talk about uh, the parity problem. So parity problem is uh, if you consider uh, uh, the representation as minus one and one, it's just going to be the sign of the product of the input. And it, you know, it's it's a very it's an old <laughs> known uh, problem. And the question is, can we learn parity? So there are many ways to to learn it, and uh, we are going to consider the case where we only, at training time, we only see examples which have a bounded a maximum number of minus one. 
So for instance, suppose that uh, you you only, despite the fact that you have uh, 50 possible variables, at training time, you will only see the, the, the total number of minus ones in the 15 variables will never be bigger than 10. And that's enough to then try to solve the problem for when you see more than 10 minus one. And that's the length generalization problem. Can you solve problems that are longer at test time that they are at train time? And that you see why now it's it's in this setting where you, you can have access to all the possible examples where the number of minus ones is less than 10, but you will see none of them when the number of minus ones is more than 10. Can you still hope to learn the function? Well, turns out, it's going to be hard indeed. And without uh, looking at, at, uh, at what's on the slide, what this basically says is that uh, we can calculate the lower degree profile of the solution. And it's always going to be lower than what it should be, which is the actual number of uh, of uh, a variable, because you want the solution should be the, the, the product of all the variables, as we said. So unfortunately, that explains why it is actually hard to learn the parity problem, even with the largest number of uh, uh, of the largest model you can think of, the you know seven billion parameter, whatever number of parameters you have. Uh, if the model is large enough, you will not be able to learn it. Uh, let me uh, show you what happens empirically. So, if you were to try to learn, for instance, a parity problem that have fifteen variables that's the 15 bits uh, with an MLP. Uh, and during training, you have you only see, uh, for instance, uh, uh, what we see here, B10 means during training, you only see uh, up to 10 variables being at the same time equal to minus one or nine or eight. That, that's what we see on the graph. So what the graph shows is the, the total, the final solution for each of these cases. So if we take, for instance, uh, let's say B10, that's the blue curve. Uh, and you look at the degree of all the terms between 0 and, and, 15, and 14 or 15. Uh, you see that they are all very low, except uh, two of them that are higher. And uh, while the correct solution should be only one of them is high, all the other ones are 0, which is <clears throat> the, the product on, on, on all of them. So that's an example to show that <clears throat> there's there's basically no hope of solving that problem unless you put the right prior, which for this problem we haven't found yet. Despite this negative result, there are positive outcome. Uh, so curriculum learning is something that has been uh, known for a long time. Actually, I think uh, my brother Yoshua proposed the first version, I forgot, maybe uh, 15 years ago. And it's the idea that there might be an order of examples that you can show to the model that will make training easier. The problem is we don't know that that order. Uh, and for this uh, problem of uh, of parity, there is an order, and and that's what we we try to show here. If you train models with an increasing number of minus ones in your training set, so you first train the model where you only show examples that have say. Uh, uh, four minus one in the in the training examples in the, in the examples and then you train for a while and then you show them up to uh, eight then up to twelve then etc then you will see that you train faster than if you were to show all of them at the same time and that's uh, that's what we see both for problems of di dimension sixteen and problems of dimension thirty on the right. So uh, that's an example of we are using basically a prior that we know is good, uh, and we are using the knowledge that we know is that uh, we are going to learn the mean degree profile, no matter what we do, to actually improve on the solution. And so uh, I think that that concludes my talk. In summary, what uh, we are interested in is uh, these problems that are very hard by nature because you will never have enough training examples to see a good representation of the problems. And they are usually combinatorial when you manipulate symbols. So we introduce this go-to setting that tries to capture the difficulty of these problems. And we showed that in, in, uh, in some cases for some class of function, you can prove what kind of function will be found 
despite the fact that you cannot have access to all the training set. Uh, we showed that this was a, a problem, in particular for the length generalization problem, for instance, for parity. <clears throat> but it can also be used, used for uh, helping the problem, you, for instance, for the curriculum learning setting. Uh, I think the, the real uh, conclusion is to think that we need to think more about the invariances that we can put, symmetries that we can think of that exist naturally in the data, such that it it uh, it goes over this uh, main degree problem. If we find the right symmetry, if we push the model to have the right sort of compositions, uh, then we may be able to solve that problem. With that, I am uh, finished <clears throat> and um, welcome your questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Sam Benjou, for the insightful talk and the uh, technical and uh, very, very in depth uh, talk. Uh, if you can, uh, I think you can uh, stop sharing the screen now. Should I stop sharing or should I, what should I do? Yeah, you, you can stop sharing. Okay. There um, you go. Okay. So we have um, uh, a list, uh, not a list of questions um, um, about reasoning and the capabilities of the mods uh, that we, or the current architectures that we are using. Nowadays, uh, first question is, is reasoning um, just a consequence uh, of learning or there is something missing in the equation that we should account for? I think uh, reasoning is, is a class of learning problems uh, for which mm -hmm. you, you need to understand some symmetries in the problem to be able to solve it. Let me contrast that with, for instance, uh, computer vision where you see, you will never see all combinations of, of pixels, of course, in all possible images, but but they are not, uh, their combination is not that important. It, it's very robust because pixels are very related to each other. You know that if uh, a subset of pixels are blue, then all the neighbor ones will all also be blue. For, for discrete variables like symbols, <laughs> there's no knowledge of each other. You, if you see a few symbols on my, it doesn't mean anything about the other symbols. So it makes the problem much more difficult than problems for which uh, there is a lot of structure in the input. So I think that's the, the extreme case of learning. That's why it's a problem. It's mainly about the input or we could work more on the uh, algorithmic uh, part and uh, work more on the, the model side, the architecture. I think we need to work more on the, on the algorithmic part. Let me give you an example. If I, if I show you many, uh, if you have like 10 variables and there's always three of them that have the same value, no matter how you put them, I think it gives you like an idea of, uh, that <clears throat> that there is some, some, some symmetry happening. How do you capture that? I think it's an open question. We don't know how to create a model or a loss function uh, or, or a training algorithm that will capture uh, relations between variables irrespective of which variables they are. And uh, that that is, I think, an, an open problem. But uh, it uh, it's exciting actually that it's open. <laughs> yeah. So um, there is another question about the the um, in your opinion, to what extent the the current LLMs and transformer based um, architectures are able to reason. We see that, for example, uh, applications like ChatGPT. Uh, do you think they they have some capabilities of reasoning, or there is something um, uh, you know a way that should be modeled by um, to to be able to reason? So there's there's a lot of things here. The, these modern uh, LLMs like ChatGPT or Bard or which other you have in mind, uh, they they are huge models where they have been trained on a huge amount of training data. And part of the success of these models is that <clears throat> they have <clears throat> seen during training very similar setting. <clears throat> so there's a lot of <clears throat> pattern matching happening actually, <clears throat> rather than reasoning. Of course, it looks like reasoning. It looks like it's able to solve a problem because it has seen a problem that was very similar and it's just uh, you know trying to find uh, the most likely solution. <clears throat> but is it actually reasoning? It's unlikely. And and the, the, 
the reason I'm saying that is that none of this problem can actually solve the simple problems I, I showed you. Uh, you people, and in particular, there's a, a nice paper from Google who tried uh, all possible, uh, you know, chain of thought, uh, prompting, all the techniques that have been developed in the past year to solve these problems. And they all help to some extent. So they, they let you generalize to longer sequences, but after a while, it actually drops. And so for you, or for us humans, the length should not matter. Once you understand the algorithm, you know, if it's uh, adding things or if it's uh, looking at the sign, whether there's 10 bits or whether there's a hundred bit, it's just a matter of, of counting. And it's a, it's a very thing, a very easy to, thing to do for humans. But for machines, after a while, it drops. So it was just able to, improve so it's pattern matching a bit better but it's still not solving the actual function and there's no no model today that can do it unfortunately unfortunately yeah. <laughs> hopefully it's soon we'll have some capabilities reason, reason yes keep... yes i think there's a lot of problem people working on this class of problems so we'll get there <laughs> so uh, on the same uh, subject of lm mini lm up uh, there is a question about um, practitioners that say that scale is all that is all you need. Do you think we will reach a plateau soon, or um, there could be some uh, findings? On, uh, in this thing? Uh, I'm not sure I understand. So the question is: uh, Are we going to get to time a place where LLM can solve all the practical problems? Is that the... it's the the, the practitioners say that uh, scale scale is all you need. So do you think uh, we'll no, reach? Uh, I, I don't think I don't think scale is all you need. <laughs> to summarize, I think scale is good, and we've done a lot in the past year or two years uh, for scale, and you see these models getting bigger and bigger, and solving more and more problems. But it's it's a it's an illusion in a way because it's not really <clears throat> understanding the problem. It's just uh, growing the number of uh, the size of the problem you can solve, but you will never have enough parameters to actually think of all the combinations of input that can exist when the number of inputs is large. And today, when you think about inputs that are very, very large, <clears throat> that means that in practice, uh, there's no way scale alone will solve it. Of course, scale is good and it it, it is uh, showing tremendous success. And I'm not saying we should not uh, do scale. We should scale when we can, but we should not Think that it's the only thing we have to do. There's plenty of other things that we have to think about to uh, solve hard problems. So scale, yes, but not enough. Yeah. So uh, another question, maybe the last one uh, we'll take um, is uh, in countries like Morocco, uh, we know that for sure that the resources and the, the GPUs and the training uh, uh, compute is uh, more and more available. But uh, we still have some computational resource um, uh, issues. What do you think, or what what would you recommend for researchers that uh, would like to advance the state of AI, uh, especially yeah. in this area, for example, to uh, push the the boundaries? So uh, a few things: uh, <clears throat> training LLMs or other foundation model requires thousands of uh, of uh, modern GPUs and. And only a few companies in the world can actually do that. Uh, uh, that's clear. That's we're not never going to get there. But training or pre-training, as it's called now, is only one part of the story. Once the, these models are trained, there's now a, a, a growing number of of those model op available open source. There's a Mistral recently. There's a I don't know. You can think of of many that are really open source. There's more and more actually people showing not only just the weight, but also the data set, the, the training procedure, and that's available to everyone. Now, with that, there's a lot of research that can be done in understanding what's in these models, uh, examining uh, you know uh, the biases that they have, how fair they are, how private they are, uh, how they solve these kind of problems. All of these questions can often be solved uh, or tackled with a very limited amount of resources, maybe one GPU or one node of a GPU, which is a small number that uh, universities can often have uh, access to. So there's a ton of research that can be done. Of course, you cannot train them, fine. 
but there's plenty of other things that you can do that are still very, uh, that can be enlightening. And despite, uh, on top of that, I want to say, as I said, I think scale is good. It's only good because it shows us that we, we can train more and more uh, complex problems. But I think it's a, it's dumb in a way. I think we should re do some research in making scale going the other way. How how much can we get from the smallest models? Not from the biggest one. There are people working on the biggest one. Work on the smallest one because these are very interesting problems. For instance, I wanted to work on my phone. I wanted to work on my watch. I wanted to work on my any small device. For this, you need much less resources. You, you need to be smarter, I think. And that's hard, but it's all of us are on the same boat. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. There, there are many directions that we can explore and uh, many uh, pushing boundaries on different um, aspects, of course. Yes. So yeah. uh, thank you, um, Dr. Sam, for the, the insights. Maybe a last word for the Morocco uh, community, peut-être en français. Oui, 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 oui. Ça m'a fait très plaisir de, de vous parler. C'est en fait très difficile de, de faire des présentations en français, je veux juste vous le dire, parce que tous les termes sont en anglais. Et il faut les connaître en français aussi, mais euh, j'ai vécu 25 ans au Québec et euh, j'ai eu ce problème pendant toute ma vie de savoir euh, quand parler en français, quand parler en anglais avec les termes techniques. Euh, et c'est très, très bien de voir qu'il y a une communauté de francophones qui travaillent dans ce domaine-là. Merci beaucoup, Dr. Sami. Uh, maybe, uh, hopefully, we can see you in person, have you in person here in Morocco in the last, uh, next uh, editions. That would be great. I, I Thank you to. so much. Thank you so much for the insightful talk and uh, for the attendees. Uh, we have other sessions. Uh, they, uh, All right. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Thank you.